three. Cool and stolid, Potch, now that he had come through these perils, never thought of himself a hero. He did not even think of publishing his experience. Today it would be inconceivable for a man to do such magnificent work and discover such momentous secrets with his mouth shut about it. But Gotch plugged on, and it is doubtful whether this hesitating, entirely modest genius of a German country doctor realized the beauty or the importance of his lonely experiments. He plugged on. He must know more. He went pell-mell at the inoculating of guinea pigs and rabbits, and at last even sheep with the innocent-looking but fatal fluid from the hanging drops. And in each one of these beasts, in the sheep, just as quickly and horribly as the mouse, a few thousands of microbes on the splinter multiplied into billions in the animals. In a few hours, they teemed poisonously in what had been robust tissues, choking the little veins and arteries with their myriads, turning to a sinister black red blood, so killing the sheep, the guinea pigs, and the rabbits. At one fantastic jump, Koch had soared out of the vast anonymous rank and file of pill rollers and landed among the most original of the searchers, and the more ingeniously hunted microbes, the more miserably he tended to the important duties of his practice. Babies in far-off towns, on far-off farms, howled, but he did not come. Peasants with jumping aches in their teeth waited sullen hours for him, and at last he had to turn over part of his practice to another doctor. Mrs. Koch saw little of him and worried and wished he would not go on his calls smelling of germicides and his menagerie of animals. But so far as he was concerned, his suffering patients and his wife might have been inhabitants of the other side of the moon, where a new mysterious question was worrying at his head, tugging at him, keeping him awake. How, in nature, these little weak anthrax bacilli that fade away and die so easily on my slides, how did they get sick animals to healthy ones. There were superstitions among the farmers and horse doctors of Europe about this disease, strange beliefs in regard to the mysterious power of this plague that hung always over their flocks and herds like some cruel invisible sword. Why, this disease is too terrible to be caused by such a wretched little creature as a twenty thousandth of an inch long bacillus. Your little germ May be what kills our herds, all right, Herr Doctor, the cattleman told Koch. But how is it that our cows and sheep can be all right in one pasture, perfectly healthy, and then when we take them to another field with fine grazing in it, they die like flies? Koch knew of this troublesome, mysterious fact, too. He knew that in Avignon in France, there were green mountains, horrible mountains, where no flock of sheep could go without being picked off one by one, or in dozens or even hundreds of the black disease anthrax. In the country of Vos, were there were fertile fields where sheep grew fat, only to die of anthrax. The peasants shivered at night by their fires. The fields are cursed. These things bothered Koch. How would this tiny bacilli live over winter, even for years in the fields and on the mountains? How could they indeed? When he had smeared a little bacillus swarming spleen from a dead mouse on a clean slip of glass and watched the microbes grow dim, break up and fade from view, and when he put the nourishing watery fluid of ox eyes on these bits of glass, the bacilli would no longer grow. When he washed the dried blood off and injected it into mice, these little beasts continued to scamper gaily about in their cages. The microbes, which two days before could have killed a heavy cow, were dead. What keeps them alive in the fields then, muttered Koch, when they die on my clean glasses in two days? And one day, he ran on to a curious sight under his microscope, a strange transformation of his microbes that gave him a clue to his question. 
Koch sat down on his stool in his 8x10 laboratory in East Prussia and solved the mystery of the cursed fields and mountains of France. He had kept a hanging drop in its closed glass well at the temperature of a mouse's body for 24 hours. Ah, this ought to be full of nice long threads of bacilli, he muttered, and he looked down the tube of his microscope. What's this? he cried. The outlines of the threads had grown dim, and each thread was speckled to its whole length with little ovals that shone brightly like infinitely tiny glass beads, and these beads were arranged along the threads as perfectly as a string of pearls. To himself, Koch muttered guttural curses. Other microbes must have doubtless gotten into my hanging drop. But when he looked very carefully, he saw that wasn't true, for the shiny little beads were inside the threads. The bacilli that make up the threads have turned into these beads. He dried this hanging drop and put it away carefully for a month or so, and then as luck would have it, looked at it once more through the, his lens. The strange strings of beads were still there, shining as brightly as ever. Then an idea for an experiment got hold of him. He took a drop of pure, fresh, watery fluid from the eye of an ox. He placed it on the drop, the dried up smear with its months old bacilli that had turned into beads. His head swam with confusion, though confused surprise as he looked and watched the beads grow back into ordinary bacilli, and then into long threads once more. It was outlandish. Those queer shiny beads have turned back into ordinary anthrax bacilli again, said Koch. The beads must be the spores of the microbe, the tough form of them that can stand great heat and cold and drying. That must be the way the anthrax microbe can keep itself alive in the fields for so long. The bacilli must turn into spores. Then Koch launched himself into thorough and genius tests to see if his quick guess was right. Expertly now, he took spleens out of the mice, which had perished of anthrax. He lifted his, this deadly stuff out carefully with heated knives and forceps. Protected from all chance of contamination by stray microbes of the air, he kept the spleens for a day at the temperature of a mouse's body. Sure enough, the microbes, every thread of them, turned into glassy spores. Then, in experiments that kept him incessantly in his dirty little room, he found that the spores remained alive for months, ready to hatch out into deadly bacilli the moment he put them into a fresh drop of the watery fluid of ox eyes, or the instant he stuck them on one of his thin slivers into the root of a mouse's tail. These spores never form in an animal while it is still alive. They only appear after he has died, and then only when he is kept very warm, said Koch. And he proved this beautifully by clapping spleens into an ice chest. And in a few days, this stuff, smeared on splinters, was no more dangerous than if he had shot so much beefsteak into his body. It was now the year 1876, and Koch was 34 years old, and at last he emerged out of the bush of Wolstein to tell the world, stuttering a little, that it was at last proved that microbes were the cause of disease. Koch put on his best suit and his gold-rimmed spectacles and packed up his microscope and a few hanging drops in their glass cells, swarming with murderous anthrax bacilli. And besides these things, he bundled a, a cage into the train with him, a cage that bounced a little with several dozen healthy white mice. He took a train for Breslau to exhibit his anthrax microbes and the way they kill mice, and the weird way in which they turn into glassy spores. He wanted to demonstrate these things to old Professor Cohn, the botanist at the university, who had sometimes written him encouraging letters. 
Professor Cohn, who had been amazed at the marvelous experiments about which the lonely Koch had written him, old Cohn snickered when he thought of how this greenhorn doctor, who had no idea himself of how original he was, would surprise the highbrows of the university. He sent out invitations to the most eminent medicos of the school to come the first night of Koch's show. Four. And they came to hear the unscientific backwoodsman, and they came. They came, maybe out of friendliness to old Professor Cohn, but Koch didn't lecture. He was never much at talking. Instead of telling them that his microbes were the true cause of anthrax, he showed these sophisticated professors. For three days and nights he showed them, taking them in swift steps through those searchings he had sweated at groping and failing often for years. Never was there a greater come down for bigwigs who had arrived prepared to be indulgent to a nobody. Koch never argued once. He never bubbled and raved and made prophecies. But he slipped slivers into mouse tails with an unearthly cleverness. And the experienced professors of pathology opened their eyes to see him handle his spores and bacilli and microscopes like a sixty-year-old master, it was a knockout. At last, Professor Kohnheim, one of the most skillful scientists in the study of diseases in all of Europe, could hold himself no longer. He rushed from the hall, hurried to his own laboratory, and burst into the room where his young student searchers were working. He shouted to them, My boys, drop everything, and go see Dr. Koch. This man has made a great discovery. Kohnheim gasped to get his breath. But who is this Koch head professor? We've never heard of him. No matter who he is, it is a great discovery, so exact, so simple. It is astounding. This Koch is not a professor, even. He hasn't even been taught how to do research. He has done it all by himself, complete. There is nothing more to do. But what is his discovery, head professor? Go, I tell you, every one of you, and see for yourselves. It, has, it is the most marvelous discovery in the realm of microbes. He will make us all ashamed of ourselves. Go! But by this time, all of them, including Paul Ehrlich, had disappeared through the door. Seven years before, Pasteur had foretold, it is within the power of man to make parasitic maladies disappear from the face of the earth. And when he said these words, the wisest doctors in the world put their fingers to their heads, thinking, this poor fellow is cracked. This night, Koch had shown the world the first step toward the fulfillment of Pasteur's seemingly insane vision. Tissues from animals dead of anthrax, whether they are fresh or putrid or dried or a year old, can only produce anthrax when they contain bacilli or the spores of bacilli. Before this fact, all doubt must be laid aside that these bacilli are the cause of anthrax, he told them finally, as if his experiments had not convinced them already. And he ended by telling his amazed audience how to fight this terrible disease, how his experiments showed a way to stamp it out in the end. All animals that die of anthrax must be destroyed at once after they die, or if they cannot be burned, they should be buried deep in the ground, where the earth is so cold that the bacilli cannot turn into the tough, long-lived long spores. So it was in these three days at Breslau that Koch put a sword of Excalibur into the hands of men, with which to begin the fight against their enemies, the microbes, their fight against lurking death. So it was that he began to change the whole business of doctors from a foolish hocus-pocus with pills and leeches into an intelligent fight where science, instead of superstition, was the weapon. Koch fell among friends, among honest, generous men at Breslau. Kohn and Kohnheim, instead of trying to steal his stuff, there are no fewer shady fellows in science than in any other human activity. These two professors immediately set up a 
great whooping for Kopf, an applause that echoed over Europe and made Pasteur a bit uneasy for his job as Dean of Microbe Hunters. These two friends began to bombard the authorities of the Imperial Health Office at Berlin about this unknown that Germany ought to be proud of. They did their best to give Koch a chance to do nothing but chase the microbes of disease, to get away from that dull practice of his. Left alone or snubbed at Breslau, he might easily have gone back to Wolstein to his business of telling people to stick out their tongues. In short, men of science have either to be showmen, as were the magnificent Spallanzini and the passionate Pasteur, or they have to have impresarios. Hush packed up Emmy and his household goods and moved to Breslau, and was given a job as a city physician at $450 a year, and was supposed to eke out his living with the private patients that would undoubtedly flock to be treated by such a brilliant man. So thought Cohn and Konheim, but the doorbell of Koch's little office did not ring. Hardly anyone came to ring it, and so Koch learned that it is a great disadvantage for a doctor to be brainy and inquire into the final causes of things. He went back to Wolstein, beaten, and here from 1878 to 1880, he made long jumps ahead in microbe hunting once more, spying and tracking down the strange subvisible beings caused the deadly infections of wounds in animals and in human beings. He learned to stain all kinds of bacilli with different colored dyes, so that the very tiniest microbe would stand out clearly. In some unknown way, he saved money enough to buy a camera, and stuck its lens against the microscope and learned, no one helping him, how to take pictures of these little creatures. You'll never convince the world about these murderous bugs until you can show them the photographs, Kopf said. Two men can't look through one microscope at the same time. No two men will ever draw the same picture of a germ. So there will always be wrangling and confusion. But, the pho but these photographs can't lie, and ten men can study them and come to an agreement on them. So it was that Koch began to try to introduce rhyme and reason into the baby science of microbe hunting, which up till now had been as much a wordy brawl as a quest for knowledge. Meanwhile, his friends at Breslau had not forgotten him, and in 1880, it was like some bush leaker breaking into the big league. He was told by the government to come to Berlin and to be extraordinary associate of the Imperial Health Office. Here, he was given a fine laboratory and suddenly undreamed of wealth of apparatus and two assistants and enough money so that he could spend 16 or 18 hours of his working day among his stains and tubes and chittering guinea pigs. By this time, the news of Koch's discoveries had spread to all of the laboratories of Europe and had crossed the ocean and inflamed the doctors of America. The vast, exciting battle of the germ theory was on. Every medical man and professor of diseases who knew, or thought he knew, the top end from the bottom end of a microscope set out to become a microbe hunter. Every week brought glad news of the supposed discovery of some new deadly microbe. Surely, the assassin of suffering from cancer or typhoid fever or consumption one enthusiast would shout across continents that he had just discovered a kind of pan germ that caused all diseases, from pneumonia to the pip, only to be forgotten for an idiot who might claim that he, he had proved one disease, let us say consumption, to be the result of the attack of a hundred different species of microbes. So great was the, the enthusiasm about germs and the confusion that Koch's discoveries were in danger of being laughed into obscurity along with the vast magazines full of balderdash that were being printed on the subject of the germ theory. And yet today we demand with great hue and cry more laboratories and more microbe hunters, better paid searchers to free us from the diseases that scourge us. How futile. For progress, God must send us a few more infernal marvelous searchers of the kind of Robert Koch. 
in the midst of the danger of in the midst of the danger that foolish enthusiasm would kill the new science of microbe hunting, Koch kept his head and sat down to find a way to grow germs pure. One germ, one kind of germ only, causes one definite kind of disease. Every disease has its own specific microbe. I know that, said Koch, without knowing it. I've got to find a sure, easy method of growing one species of germ away from all other contaminating ones that are always threatening to sneak in. But how to cage one kind of microbe? All manner of weird machines were being invented to keep different sorts of germs apart. Several microbe hunters devised apparatus so complicated that when they had finished building it, they probably had already forgotten what they set out to invent it for keep stray germs of the air from falling into their bottles, some heroic searchers did their inoculations in an actual rain of poisonous germicides. Part 5. Until one day, Koch, who frankly admitted it was by accident, looked at the flat surface of half of a boiled potato left on the table of his laboratory. What is this, I wonder, he muttered, as he stared at a curious collection of little colored droplets scattered on the surface of the potato. Here's a gray drop, a gray colored drop here. There's a red one. There's a yellow, a violet one. These little specks must be made up of germs from the air. I'll have a look at them. He stuck his short-sighted eyes down close to the potato so that his scraggly little beard almost dragged in it. He got ready his thin plates of glass and polished off the lenses of his microscope. With a slender wire of platinum, he fished delicately into one of the gray droplets and put a bit of its slimy stuff in a little pure water between two bits of glass under his microscope. Here he saw a swarm of bacilli swimming gently about, and every one of these microbes looked exactly like his thousands of brothers in this drop. Then Koch peered at the bugs from a yellow droplet on the potato, and at these, and th at those of a red one and a violet one. The germs from one were round, from another, they had the appearance of swimming sticks. From a third, microbes looked like living corkscrews. But all the microbes in one given drop were like their brothers, invariably. Then in a flash, Koch saw the beautiful experiment nature had done for him. Every one of these droplets is a pure culture of one definite kind of microbe, a pure colony of one species of germs. How simple! When germs fall from the air into the liquid soups we have been using, the different kinds of them get all mixed up and swim among each other. But when different bugs fall from the air on the solid surface of this potato, each one has to stay where it falls. It sticks there. It grows there. Multiplies into millions of its own kind. Absolutely pure. Kutch called Loeffler and Gafke his two military doctor assistants, and soberly he showed them the change in the whole mixed-up business of microbe hunting that his chance glance at an abandoned potato had brought. It was revolutionary. The three of them set to work with an, amaz with an amazing, loyal Frenchman might call it stupid, German thoroughness to see if Koch was right. There they sat before the three windows of their room, Koch before his microscope on a high stool in the middle, Loeffler and Gafke on stools on his left hand and his right, a kind of grimly toiling trinity. They tried to defeat their hopes, but quickly they discovered that Koch's prophecy was an even was an even more true one than he had dreamed. They made mixtures of two or three kinds of germs, mixtures that could never have been untangled by growing them in flasks of soup. They streaked these confused species of microbes on the cut flat surface of boiled potatoes, and where each separate tiny microbe landed, there it stuck, and grew a colony of millions of its own kind, and nothing but its own kind. Now Koch, who by the simple experience of the old potato had changed microbe hunting from a guessing game into something that came nearer the sureness of a science. Koch, I say, got ready to track down the tiny messengers that bring a dozen murderous diseases to mankind. 
Up until this time, Koch had very little criticism or opposition from other men of science, mainly because he almost never opened his mouth until he was sure of his results. He told of his discoveries with his disarming modesty, and his work was so unanswerably complete. He had a way of seeing the objections that critics might make and replying to them in advance, that it was hard to find protesters. Full of confidence, Koch went to Professor Rudolf Virchow, by far the most eminent German researcher in disease, an incredible savant who knew more than there was to be known about a greater number of subjects than any 16 scientists could possibly know. Virchow was, in brief, the ultimate poobah of German medical science. He had spoken the very last word on clots in blood vessels and had inventive, invented the impressive words heteropopia, agonesia, and ochronosis, and many others that I have been trying for years to understand the meaning of. He had, with tremendous mistakenness, maintained that consumption and scrofula were two different diseases. But with his microscope, he had made genuinely good, even superb descriptions of the way sick tissues look, and he had turned his lenses into every noisome nook and cranny of 26,000 dead bodies. Virchow had printed, I do not exaggerate, thousands of scientific papers on every subject imaginable, from the shapes of little German schoolboys' heads and noses to the remarkably small size of the blood vessels in the bodies of sickly green-faced girls. Properly odd, as anyone would be, Koch tiptoed respectfully into this presence. I have discovered a way to grow microbes pure, unmixed with other germs, Herr Professor. Herr Professor, the bashful Koch told Virchow with deference. And how, I beg you tell me, can you do that? It looks to me to be impossible. By growing them on solid food, I can get beautifully isolated colonies of one kind of microbe on the surface of a boiled potato. And now I have invented a better way than that. I mix gelatin with beef broth, and the gelatin sets and makes a solid surface and... But Virchow was not impressed. He made a sardonic remark that it was so hard to keep different races of germs from getting mixed up that Koch would have had to have a separate laboratory for each species of microbe. In short, Virchow was very sniffish and cold to Koch, for he had come to that time of life when aging men believe that everything is known and there is nothing more to be found out. Koch went away a bit depressed but not one jot was he discouraged. Instead of arguing and writing papers and making speeches against Virchow, he launched himself into the most exciting and superb of all his microbe huntings. He set out to spy upon, the dis to spy upon and discover the most vicious of microbes, that mysterious marauder which each year killed one man, woman, and child out of every seven that died in Europe and in America. Koch rolled up his sleeves and wiped his gold-rimmed glasses and set out to hunt down the microbe of tuberculosis.